You guys all right? Woo, what a week. Could have rained all week. Had all week to rain. All right. We still need it. It's all right. I look forward to mowing. Um, I had a good doctor's visit today, a good checkup. So everything is good. Heart's beating well. Highway is open. Blood's flowing. So I'm going to give it one more year. At least. And we'll see next year. I, I go year at a time. See how it's going. But I'm committed for one more. So that was good stuff. Um, so it was a good week. Uh, and uh, we're starting our family life series. So I'm excited about that. Um, the, I thought, you know, there's a story I know kind of about, the, about Adam and Eve. Robert, you might remember this, but uh, there was a pastor that had a, uh, he had a loose leaf Bible. And uh, you got to be careful, you know, it's one of those Bibles that you could pop the pages out. Well, he was stood up from the congregation and he had lost one of the leaves. He didn't realize it. So he's reading, and he's reading in Genesis, and he says, so Adam said to Eve, he turns to the next page, and it obviously didn't make sense. He said, so Adam said to Eve, he says, so Adam said to Eve, it looks like there's a leaf missing somewhere. <laughs> so you got to be careful what you, when you're reading the Bible, you got to be sure you're on the right verses together. So it makes sense. I don't know why I want to tell you that, but I just wanted you to hear that today. Family life, to get you started on the life of the family. So let's pray. We need to pray. There's, I get tired of the needless loss of lives, you know, that happens. So let's pray for some people. Father God, we pray again for those that were uh, lives were taken in a mass shooting again and we lift those families up to you and, um, and we pray your comfort on them and your your understanding and your guidance in their lives and and pray for the protection of our children and this generation we give them to you we know you want to use them. We know you have powerful, positive activity to bring. So we welcome you to replace the darkness of men's hearts in every way that you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Boy, that thunder was a good effect there. Just perfect. The darkness of man's heart. The, thunder. the Lord is there. He listens. He knows. Um, I, I want to talk, um, I, I always like, this is a good time of the year to talk about the family, so I always like talking about the family this time of the year, and talk about some of the, the, uh, the building stones that we have to have uh, in family to create the, the healthy environment that God wants us to have for relationships to grow in the Lord, the way that God wants them to grow in the Lord, and so at this time of the year, when we start approaching Mother's Day, Father's Day, like Daniel said, it's so good to come and begin to start talking about the family, okay? And one of the reasons I love talking about the family is because the family uh, was God's design for his people in the way that they should live life and live life to the fullest, as, as John 10.10 10 tells us about living life to its fullness. But the family is part of God's design. It's part of God's plan. It's the way God intended things to be. And so anytime Satan begins to attack God's people, he's always going to attack at the point of the family. Okay? As a society deteriorates, deteriorates, it begins at the point of the family. It's the strength of the family 
that has always been the strength that God brings to his people to begin to make the stand for him that we should be making uh, in our world. Family was just designed as a part of God's plan. And Genesis 2.18 says, Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone, and so I will make a helper, helpmate, who is just right for him. I love this, that we, man and woman, were created for each other, and as they come together, we have this complete picture and image of what God is really all about. And so family was something that God put together. He designed. I love this scripture in Proverbs 18, 22. It says that the man who finds a wife finds a treasure. Okay? And he receives favor from the Lord. So it's not hard. It's very easy to open the scripture up and begin to build the case for the fact that family is something that God has designed for us. It was created by God. It's God's plan. It's not the pastor's plan. It's not something that I came up with. It's not the plan that the state came up with or the created. It's not something the king came up with. It's not something, uh, Lord forbid, that the government thought of. It's not at all. It was God's plan. God is the one who planned it. And God created the family unit to be a healthy place for us to grow, but to grow spiritually, to be everything that God would want us to be. He created the fam, the clan, the gang, your crib. I don't care what you call it, okay? Whatever you want to call it. That's probably not even appropriate. But whatever you call it, it's God's idea. And, and health, healthy family, uh, whenever your, your family is really healthy, it's one of the hardiest life-giving environments that could exist in the entire world. Okay? God just flourishes there when you allow him to do that. He really uh, works inside the family. And God still, I believe, is in the business of matching up uh, men and women. He, he, he wants to match man up with the helper. I still believe in the verse in Genesis chapter 2, I will make a helper, look at this, who is what? Who is almost right for you or might be of some help? No, who is what? Just right for you. I still believe that God puts us together and that you seek and you search for that person that God has for you, uh, that man or that woman, depending on which gender you are, and, and he teams you up, okay? And so he teams you up. And this, is, this helper word right here uh, makes a helper for you. I think it speaks to both women and men right here, okay? That God has this helpmate for you, this special person that's there for you. He's speaking as if the man has a special woman, yes. But we each have this special man or woman in our life that God wants to put us together with, okay? And so for the woman, the man, for the man, the woman, and this is probably one of the most uplifting terms you could use about someone, okay? This helper, this special person. This is why we should never speak to a spouse in a, in, in a, in a negative uh, type of connotation because this is a special person that's given to us by God. And so we need to love them and nurture them, okay? And it's probably the, this is just the most uplifting term you could ever use for a person of any type. Uh, this completer, this helpmate, this fulfiller. Ever a positive term that you could come up to describe it as, you could use it for this person, okay? That's how important they are in your life. And so the right spouse, okay, uh, can be a treasure in your life. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, okay? Now, the when, when you read that, you think, oh, so you just kind of have to get a wife. It really doesn't matter. You just got to grab one. Hey, I need a wife over there. Oh, this will work. I'll just grab this wife. Okay? Isn't that kind of what it feels like? That if you find a wife, you find a treasure. Well, there's something that's understood in the language of that scripture, and that is it has to be a virtuous wife. Okay? Uh, it's, it's a special wife that becomes a treasure. Just not any old wife will work. I didn't mean to use the word old there, but any wife would work, okay? 
Uh, it, it, it's not like that. The translation is that you're taking for granted that it's going to be a good wife that's going to be virtuous and loving and supporting and helping and joyful and cheerful and a blessing to have around that begins to impact your life in a positive way. That kind of wife or spouse is a blessing in your life. Okay? And so that kind of, of person uh, begins to really influence the way the rest of your life is going to be lived by God. And so I would challenge you to this, that if, if you are in a dating relationship and you're dating someone, you're connected with someone, and if that person is not the kind of godly person that you would consider marrying, then you need to stop dating them. And you need to look for that person that would be the virtuous blessing and treasure that God would want you to have in your life. And you need to save yourself and your relationship for that person. Okay? And so that's going to go against culture a little bit. Okay? But it doesn't go against God's Word. It goes with God's Word. And so I just challenge you that. And I challenge our, our uh, generation of young people to really consider that as you begin to look for that person that God has for you uh, in your life and that spouse is prepared for you. You need it to be the person that God intends, according to the scripture, for you to have as your spouse and that will begin to change everything in your life, okay? So family is the design by God. So we're going to be talking about the family over the next few weeks and we're talking about God's design for us, okay? Now, family was designated to create relational, a relationally safe environment. God creates the family so that we'll have a good, healthy, relational environment that will help us grow and become everything that God wants us to be. So what that means is that as parents, we're always trying to create a good, healthy environment. We work on the environment. We, we put some effort into that. We plan in that. We work at that. We want to make this a healthy place for our kids. Okay? should not be a dangerous place. should be a very, very safe place place. We want a safe environment. I love the scripture, Proverbs 1.8. It says, listen, my son, to your father's instruction. Oh, that's my favorite verse in the whole Bible right there, I think. <laughs> All right. To your, your father's instruction. And do not ignore your mother's teaching. Okay. Teaching us something about the environment that we need to create. Uh, and then Ephesians 6.4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. My least favorite verse. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. It's actually a great verse, okay? And then Proverbs 22, 6, direct your children unto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it, okay? Good, good family verses that we use to build what? A safe environment, okay? A, a godly, Christian, safe environment that's committed to the stuff of the Lord that's consistent in its direction of the family. We have to be consistent in this. We can't be on a few days, off a few days, on a few days, off. It doesn't work that way. The sooner we start with our children on this, the better. Okay? Uh, if family is to be anything, it's to be a relationally safe zone. Now here's the reality. The reality is in the families that we see today for many people, Family is a relational war zone that they grow up in. And it's a mess. And it causes destruction in their emotional lives, their spiritual lives. And it leads to acts that bring down and rains down sin on this world and destruction on this world. Okay? Why? Because many times they're just raised in a war zone. And their family is not a good environment. Their family is a dangerous environment. That's not the way God wants us to raise our children. Okay? He wants us to raise them in a safe place. Okay? So regardless of where you find yourself in family, you want to start working towards that goal of having a safe environment for them to live and to grow and to thrive relationally. Okay? And this is something that God wants us to be focused on. He wants us to work at. He wants us as uh, moms and dads 
to be creative and to set goals on how we could do that better. It needs to be a focus for us. Uh, if, if, if you're just focused on, on your career and you forget to focus on that, you're creating havoc in the lives of your children in the future. Okay? So you got to be focused on this. Now, I want to say this about this also. Just because you're focused on it and do this exactly like God wants you to does not mean it's going to work perfectly every time. Okay, don't throw that down on yourself, all right? Because children grow up to be adults, and sometimes those adults, they make different decisions than we want them to, okay? I don't want you carrying that guilt around. I just want you to work your hardest at it, your best, and give the rest of it to God and say, all right, Lord, I did the best I can, so now they're yours, okay? So I'm not trying to tell you that this is a promise, but I'm telling you, you got a far better chance of this working out good if you'll work at it the way that the Scripture tells us to do it, okay? And so that's not a promise to you that it always is going to be perfect because sometimes children will wander away and sometimes God has to bring them back through some processing and that that happens all the time, okay? Now, the first directive is given uh, to the children, okay? Listen to your father's instruction, okay? Listen to fatherly instruction. Now, The idea of fatherly instruction is the idea of the way that God gives his word or God gives his commands or God gives his directives to his children, okay? God always comes to us and he always gives us direction. He gives us direction through the scripture. He gives us his commandments. He gave us our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. He said Jesus for us. God always makes the decision that's going to be best for us And God always does it in a loving, fatherly way. And so what this verse is telling us that as fathers, we should give that type of instruction to our kids, just as the heavenly father does to the children that he loves so much. And so we're bringing that that instruction. So therefore, it's good for our children, it's good for you to listen to, to that instruction and apply it to your life because it's coming to you from this loving, caring, spiritual, advising father that only wants what's best for you, okay? That's the way we're supposed to receive that. And so that's the way the scripture encourages you to receive that. And then it says to follow the instruction of a mother, okay? And it's almost the idea that you need to follow the instruction of your mother it, whenever you're like 16, 17, or 18 year old, you want to follow it exactly like you used to when you were a three year old, okay? When, or when you were an infant, maybe. When everything that the mother did for you was what you needed for survival, it says you need to listen to your mother's instruction with that kind of focus, okay? That my life and my future and, and my spiritual growth really depends on me paying attention to my mother. Okay, so spiritual instruction of a father and then this spiritual instruction that also comes from the mother that you need to live that out to the fullest that you possibly can. All right, good stuff. The second uh, directive here goes to the parents. <clears throat> and he starts, and I started with the dad. Do not provoke your children to anger, but instead provide early, I like to say it this way, early, consistent direction to the things of God, okay? So as a father, I'm not trying to teach my, to train and teach my kids in a way that would make them rebel towards me. I don't want to provoke them. I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to be harsh to them. But I do want to be straightforward with them. And I want to teach them in the most loving, consistent, directional way that I possibly can. And it's important to start early, okay? The earlier you start, do not wait till they're 15 to discipline them or you're cooked, all right? It won't work, all right? Why? They're already bigger and stronger than you are. You're in trouble, I'm telling you, you know? There were times with our children I won't even mention their names because that would be unfair, right? Which ones were which? But there were times uh, with our children that I honestly thought we were not going to win the battle. I thought, we're losing this. There is no way, okay? I can remember going, you remember this, Tisa? We, 
One time with one of our kids, we were trying to get them to put their pants on at two years old. And, and they decided, I'm not putting my pants on. So we turned him upside down, stuck his pants on him, okay? Why? Because we were bigger than him. That worked easy, okay? But I can tell you, there was a point in that, that battle that I thought, I don't think we're going to get his pants on, and I don't think he's ever going to do anything that we tell him to do for the rest of his life, okay? So my point with that is start early. Don't wait till too late. You've got to begin to set the process before they get too old because it's not that you can't do it, but you're going to be way behind. And so the sooner that you start that and the more consistent you are with that, it's going to be just far easier for you in, in, in raising those children. And then, and then the scripture says that direct them on the right path. So when they're young, you have to be directing them on the right path. Why? So if they ever wander off of it someday, hopefully they're going to come back to it. Okay? They're going to come back to that path, that relationship with God, that path that, that we want them to work on. Okay? And so as a parent, we're all about just putting our kids on the right path. And if you can get them on the right path, on the right road, then you're way ahead of the game. Okay? One of the great things about our our children's ministry is the fact that uh, Casey and Rachel, you guys do a great job of exposing our children to the gospel of Jesus at a very young age. Okay? They're exposed to it. They're talked to about it at their level, very simple level. But they're talked to about it. Why? Because if a child makes a commitment to Christ when they're young, the chances of them living for Jesus as an adult are, are absolutely amazingly more than if they don't, okay? The, the, it's astronomical, the difference. Children that grow up with no influence of God, it, their chances of coming to Christ at, at an older age, now I know the Holy Spirit and God can do anything, or the Lord through the Spirit can do anything, I get that, okay? But the chances are great, phenomenally different when they're exposed to that gospel uh, message at a young age, okay? So family was just designed to create a relational safe environment. One of the greatest things, my father, who was not a pastor, okay, I've had to learn this on my own. My dad was not a pastor. And my dad worked in the oil field, okay? He was an equipment salesman. And, uh, but my dad, when I was about eight or nine years old, set me, I was just turning nine, set me on his knee and explained to me what it means to accept Christ as a personal savior. And I sat there and gave my life to Christ. I'd begin asking him some questions. And he didn't take me to the pastor. He did it. Okay? He was confident enough in the spiritual walk that he was able to lead me to make a commitment of my life to Christ. And guess what? We'll always have that in common. Forever. For eternity. It impacted my life in a way that I, I could not describe uh, how powerful of an impact that had on my life that my dad would care enough to be the spiritual leader in the home and lead me towards that. And <clears throat> not provoke but to direct uh, me as a son. It's impacted my life dynamically, okay? Family is fully dynamic when it's built around spiritual goals. When it's built around common spiritual goals, okay? So <clears throat> when you're in this together as husband and wife, you've got to have the same common spiritual goals. It makes the family so much more dynamic, okay? Now, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 says a little more negative than I did. It says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. You know what yoke means, tied together. Two oxen, they have a yoke on top of them. What's it doing? It's holding them together, okay? Don't be yoked together with unbelievers for what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? There's no commonness there. Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? If someone is in the light and someone's in the darkness, there's no real fellowship there. They've got to be believers together, okay? <clears throat> so do not be yoked with unbelievers, okay? Philippians 2, 3 says it this way. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. And if you, as a, a mom and dad, are committed to the one purpose of spiritual uh, outcome in your lives, your chances of creating a fully dynamic family are great. Okay? But you guys got to be committed to the same thing. Man, this is good stuff. Okay? 
This is great stuff. Uh, you got to put the family together around the right spiritual goals. And here's the question. How can I be obedient with my family? I mean, how can I do this the way God wants me to do it? How can I be sure the family's moving to where God wants me to move, to accomplish what God wants me to accomplish? That's the question that you have to ask. How do I do that in my own family? Okay? Now, uh, family is hard enough. (laughs) I always said this. I said, God gives me a family to keep me humble. All right? Uh, I believe that. I don't get away with anything with my family. All right? If I, can, if I stand up here and tell you something that's not right, I got five people that will correct me when I get home immediately. And they don't mind telling me how much of a loser I am sometimes, okay? I said that a little aggressive, didn't I? But <laughs> not always, though. Uh, but they, they don't mind doing that. They, and I think that's why God gives us a family, so we just can't fake it. You know, it's like you got to be real with your family. Because your family can see through you. They know better. They know all that spiritual jargon you're throwing out there. That's a block. They know better than that, right? They see the real you, okay? Because they see me. You see me in the good times. I'm always good on Sunday, okay? Uh, I'm not always good on Monday. I'm different on Tuesday. And if I pull the pastor card with my family, they don't even listen. They're just like, put it up, Dad, because we're not going with that, okay? So it just doesn't work with them. But family is hard enough. Trying to do it and being on a different spiritual page, that's impossible. I mean, you're, you're, you're causing yourself to do something that's hard to do. Don't be unequally yoked. Here's the idea. Don't take an oxen that pulls straight, pulls hard. Don't take an oxen and yoke it with a donkey. All right? Taylor, I used the, the good word, Donkey. <laughs> Even though the Bible would use a different word, I'm using this one just for the sake of being, being okay. Uh, and so you don't want to be yoked with a donkey that pulls away from you, that's stubborn, that won't move the way you're trying to move. Don't be yoked with an, a donkey. All right? <clears throat> if, you, if, you, if you are, you're going to want to use the other word. I'm telling you, you won't use the word donkey <laughs> when you get here. All right, uh, there's, there's no common righteousness there. Uh, there's no common spiritual fellowship there. There's no common light of God there. Okay, if there's, there's, there's light with darkness. You need light with light, okay, if you're going to move the way that God wants you to move. And so I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times people actually find a spouse and marry them, and they've never asked them where they are spiritually. Don't make that mistake. Find out where they're at. Know where they're at spiritually, you know? Uh, don't, you, you can't come into the pastor's office and sit down and start premarital counseling and say, well, I don't know if they're a Christian or not. You probably need to know, okay? And I, I'm just saying that because the Scripture tells us that. Plus, it makes common sense. I don't, you know, I wouldn't have to spend much time on that to understand that. You have to have, and you're after spiritual unity. Why? Because I'm after a soulmate, I'm after someone that I can really be connected with my soul to. I'm I'm looking for a prayer partner. I'm looking for someone that will join with me and pray about what kind of family we're going to develop and build and pray for our children. I'm looking for a joint heir with Jesus. Someone that's saved and knows Christ and is is a partner with Christ in the way that they're living their lives and is going to spend eternity in heaven with him. I'm looking for a ministry partner that I might serve together. I'm looking for an accountability person that's going to hold me accountable to be and do what I'm supposed to. I'm looking for someone with the same purpose in life. Why? Well, this brings richness in your relationship and health in the family. That's why. Okay? Tisa and I, we've, since we first met, have served God together. Okay? I went to her house visiting the singles in our church. You ever do visitation? In the old Baptist church, we used to do a lot of visitation. Okay? And so I would go over to Tisa and say, hey, you want to go visiting tonight? You know? Finally, her mother said, are you not paying attention? He likes you. She goes, well, no, he doesn't. We're going visiting. All right? So we've always served God together in everything that we did. And so we began dating, and our dating life was 
I would pick her up, we would go to a church, I would preach, and she would lead the music, okay? I tried to help her lead the music once, but she fired me, and so I didn't get to do that anymore. And so she would lead the music, and so I would preach. And so we did that together until the point where we were married, and we've always served in ministry together, right? Always have. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that partner in ministry, the partner in Christ uh, to be yours, and this creates a dynamic relationship and family. Perfect? No, it's not perfect. We're not perfect. Uh, I, that's one thing that I will, I will never claim to be as a pastor. We, we fail in this, but we're committed to it. We work at it. it it's what we are all about. We, we put family first, and that's a game changer. Okay? We have to change we have to flip the field on Satan in our lives. And the family that's beginning to be committed to Christ is the way we begin to flip the field on him. Okay? And we begin to have this fully dynamic family once we identify our spiritual goals with our family and make spiritual goals an important part of what we do as a family. Okay? And I'm going to tell you, I've watched you guys do that. I've watched many people in our church come together commit together, say, we're going to come to church. We're going to be committed. We're going to serve in a ministry together. This is going to be our place. And I've watched your lives just grow richer and richer and richer. Hadn't been easy, but it's created a, a spiritual dynamic in your lives and in your family that you didn't have before. Okay? Family is the conduit for God's richest blessings. It's, the, it's where they flow from. It's where they come from. I love this. Grandchildren are a crown of aged men. Oh, I'm living that out right now, right? I, I, I have, I, I got a crown now, all right? It's just got one and a half jewels in it, but we're working on it. I almost got two jewels in it, okay? But it's the crown. Grandchildren are the crown of an aged man. And the glory of children is their fathers who live godly lives. Oh, man, that's the glory of children. It's not just fathers. It, it, it's fathers that live a godly life. A godly family is where the current of God's electric presence begins to flow in your lives. Okay? It's where the blessings are rich. Psalms chapter uh, 13. What verse do you have up there? Oh, 127. I got verse 1,327. But you got 127. That's correct. I knew mine was wrong. Children are a gift from God. They're a reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. Isn't that awesome? Wow. We had a birthday party last night for Tia. We celebrated two weeks early. Why did we, why did we do that? I think we're busy rest of the month. 26 teenage girls in one place is loud. Oh my gosh. And energetic and powerful and scary all at the same time. All right. It was crazy. Okay. I love kids. They've got such energy and they're great. They're, they're delightful and they're hopeful and they see a future. And I'm an old man that's kind of depressed and I'm not sure what this economy's doing and Lord knows the government stinks and stuff like that, right? Well, we need that from them. They can bring that. The key to a family, the way God wants the family to be, is parents that are committed to God's way, to God's direction. This is the key to entering the promised land. Remember Joshua? They've already been wandering through the desert, not quite getting there. They could see the promised land, but because of the generation's lifestyle, they weren't going to get to go in. Then when it comes for Joshua to actually take the promised land and go in, he says this. He says at the beginning, as for me and my house, we will, uh, we will serve the Lord. Oh, finally they're ready, God says. They're ready. The family's ready. Now it's time. We've got to roll. It's time to move. Make the commitment. Open up God's flow. 
open up God's blessing in your life. Grandchildren are a crown. They're a crown. But the glory of a child is the godly father who lives a godly life. Children can be like an arrow. I love this. When you raise them in a good, healthy, godly family, they can be sharp. They can have a nice arrow. They can have a feather on the end that that helps it fly straight. And when they hit the target, there's a sharpness. Boom, they hit the target. If you take God out of the family, they're just a stick. (laughs) It's not an arrow, it's a stick. Okay, but with God, man, they're, they're an arrow that, that flies straight. And, and kids are amazing warriors for God. My children are warriors for God. They have more guts than I ever had. They live in a world that's crazier than I grew up in. I'm telling you that. And they're still sharp for God. You see, we, we can't use the fact that, oh, well, this world is so terrible. We can't raise good kids anymore. That's not true. That's not true. You just got to be committed to the Lord with them. You got to trust them to God. And you got to give them to the Lord because the Lord still wants to use them. You just have to set them up to be used the way God wants them to be used. How joyful when the quiver, you know, where the arrows are is full. Or when you reach back and there's one there. I tell you, I, I miss my house not as full as it used to be. My two boys left the house. I didn't feel as safe anymore. I was like, man, I lost two warriors. And I, you know, it's just up to me now. I'm going to have to fight the fight sometimes, all right? But I found out that girls can be pretty good warriors themselves, you know? And you can depend upon them. Boy, I tell you, I pray for our kids. I, I pray that God will use them in the next generation. I don't know how long God will delay his coming or Jesus will delay his coming. I don't know how long that's going to be. But I know this, God's got some work to do in this generation because if we're still here, he's not done yet. And I know that he will use godly families to impact this community and this world that we live in. So family is that conduit of the richest blessings of God. We just have to trust it, believe it, keep them close to the Lord, keep them serving God, keep them in God's word, uh, raise them to the best that we can under the, the direction of God's word, and then trust them to God. And God will build the families that we need. So I love family life. I love talking about family. We'll be talking about through the next three weeks. So let's bow our heads together for prayer at this time, if you would. Now let me say this about family with our heads bowed. Just a second. Without a commitment to Christ, it's going to be hard for you to be the parent you need to be. You've got to get your spiritual stuff together. Today might be the day for you to say, all right, I've been messing around. It's time for me to get right. It's time for me to get my heart where it belongs with God so I can be the spiritual influence that I need to be. Either God's given you children or he's going to. Your family's going to grow and you just want to be ready for it. You need to get ready spiritually for God to use you. So what do you do? Ask God to forgive you where you fall short. Ask him to forgive you your sin. Give your life to him. Commit your life to him. If you've never done it, believe in him. Accept him. Make him your Lord and Savior. Put him in charge. Make him the boss. And then trust yourself and trust your family to him. Get your heart ready. Because God wants to use you. If that's your commitment, why don't you make it right now? I'll give you just a few seconds to make some kind of decision between you and God. It doesn't matter how you say it. You don't have to say it exactly like I did. Just anything close. Just give your heart to God. Trust Him with your life. Believe in Him right now. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for today. We love you. We pray that our families will be healthy and successful. I know it'll be a battle, but we know that the richest blessings flow from that unit when it's given to you. We commit the family to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you.